When you paint a mini with a brush, a bad mix still goes on the model. But with an airbrush, a bad mix might mean nothing goes on the model. Well, maybe frustration. And trust me, I've been there. Spider webbing, pooling, clogs, and grainy blends. Weeks where I thought, maybe I'm just not cut out for this. But then, I stumbled upon some arcane secrets and they revealed to me the flow. Welcome, welcome, I'm Wiley Wizard. When you first step into painting miniatures, everyone tells you to thin your paints, and that's in reference to a paintbrush, a little wet palette work, a few light coats, job done. But airbrushing, that's a whole different battlefield. Here, viscosity isn't just about the smoothest application, it's the difference between your airbrush singing <laughs> and just flat out refusing to work. The margin for error is tiny, the frustrations, immense. The internet is filled with advice that might work for someone else's brush, someone else's paint, someone else's environment, and someone else's task, but not for you. In this video, I'm gonna break it all down. The science, the gear, the magic. I'll show you the secrets that turned me into a thinning wizard after a year long of trial, error, and some truly ugly minis. You'll see why there's no perfect mixing ratio, how Bernoulli is messing with your spray, and why this mini glass beaker might be the most important tool in your paint booth. Learn the flow, and you'll never fear the mix again. With any advanced skill that you learn, the best thing to do is to break it down to the basics, and in this case, science, and more specifically, chemistry and physics. When we talk about chemistry in terms of thinning paints, we're looking at what the thinners are actually made out of. And what I've kind of gathered by looking at all of the materials and buying and testing some of them, as well as research, is that there's generally three classes of thinners. You have a fast drying thinner, a slower drying thinner, and just plain old water. A fast drying thinner tends to contain a bit more alcohol and those types of chemicals, which obviously evaporate faster. The slow drying thinners tend to have glycols in them, which is another family of alcohol, but they definitely dry slower. They have almost like an oily texture to them and it will slow down the drying process of any mix. When it comes to water, well, it's just plain water. Most guys use distilled water because you don't want any kind of mineral contaminants. A lot of paint pigments are made out of metal, and then you put other metals near them, it might create some weird interactions. The interesting thing about water is that a lot of high-end airbrush artists actually recommend it as a thinner. And through my testing, I've actually kind of found that to not be the case for miniature painting. They rant and rave about how good water is for flow and avoiding tip dry and all of that. One thing I had to come to understand is that their canvas is a lot different than what we're using. They generally use a 2D surface like a canvas or a board that's been painted with a primer, a very textured, flat, even surface. Well, air flows just about the same over that entire surface, right? I mean, you can change the angle, bringing the airbrush up and down, but the surface that you're painting is flat, two-dimensional. When we get into painting miniatures, we introduce a third dimension, right? And that creates different figures and features on a miniature, like a curved shoulder pauldron and different elements of their armor, cloaks, whatever. Well, it took me a while to kind of come to this understanding, but it, I kind of realized that the way fluid dynamics work over surfaces that are especially curved uh, introduces something known as the Bernoulli effect. And that's kind of the principle that allows flight to happen and sailing and you know so many other things. But the bottom line is that when you have a fluid and you flow it over a curved surface, to stay caught up with the rest of the flow, it needs to move faster, right? That faster movement creates a lower pressure zone. Those pressure differences are going to create a situation where your paint might want to pull or push in unexpected ways. So I've kind of crossed water off the list as a thinner or reducer for painting miniatures. If you use water and you start painting miniature, it tends to want to pool up. And once it starts pooling, the varying pressures will 
pull that pool or push it down a crack or spider web it. Whatever the case, it, <laughs> it creates results that you don't want. I kind of took the principles that I learned from that and went the opposite direction, right? So started getting really heavy into using the fast drying thinners. While they avoid a lot of the issues that might be caused by pressure differences and the Bernoulli effect, they can also be a bit too aggressive and too fast drying. So you might get a little bit of grainy textures along borders or if you spray down a really bold line, it might be hard to like blend in later with a little feathering. Kind of the best solution I've stumbled upon is to combine the slow drying and the fast drying thinners. But I'd start at like a, say 60 to 80% fast drying to a 40 to 20% slow drying. And that's how the basics set me on the path to becoming a thinning wizard. We know that in air brushing, we need an air source. So we have an air compressor with hopefully an adjustable PSI gauge on it where we can then set the PSI to our desired range. I generally stick between 12 up to 20. You know, 12 is ultra detail, fine stuff. 20 being more like priming. Okay, so find one that's somewhere in that range that works well. And just so you know, PSI is something that you will kind of have to play around with and experiment. And I, I kind of highly recommend figuring that all out before you get to the mixing of the paint part because you don't want to be playing with two pretty big variables at the same time and turning the knobs on those. The other big obvious thing in the equipment department is the actual airbrush. There's hundreds of models that are available and one thing that is pretty plain to see when you get into it is that they might have different size needle and nozzles. Generally speaking, a larger needle and nozzle is capable of spraying thicker paints. But when it comes to the ultra detail and smaller nozzle sizes, you really need to thin it down. With those variables under control, we can finally begin the mixing process. If you're already into mixing airbrush paints and you got your own methods, your own chemistries, whatever locked down, you can kind of just skip this next part. But I will warn everybody else that this next segment might be a little opinionated in what I think are the best practices to thinning paints when you're just getting started. One of the first things that I strongly advise against is mixing or thinning your paints within the airbrush cup. Okay, I know that a lot of people online advise that that's how you should do it and that it's fine or whatever, but I kind of disagree. There's a lot of issues that might arise from it and there's some information that you're missing out on by mixing in the paint cup. The biggest issue I have with mixing within the airbrush paint cup is that you can't see the mix, right? How do you know how thin it is if you can't see it? If you go to do the next mix, are you gonna remember exactly how many drops you had or this or that? It just, I don't think it's a great idea when you can't observe something that you're trying to dial in and we'll get into more of observation when I show my secret weapon, but let's just talk about a few of the other things I don't like about mixing your paint or thinning your paint in the airbrush paint cup. When you start using a paintbrush in the airbrush cup to thin or mix the paint up, you might actually be scraping the paint cup because the metal on the ferrule might be harder than the metal in the paint cup. Additionally, you could be introducing contaminants into the paint. Some bristles might come off of the brush and get lodged into the air passage or the needle passage. And trust me when I say that that's not a fun issue to address. Like identifying it at first is the hard part. So those are two compelling reasons why I advise against mixing in the paint cup. And I also advise against backflowing. I know a lot of people do that too, but when you're first getting started, uh, there's a lot of things that could go wrong in backflowing, like if your needle set screw isn't adjusted properly, you could be shooting paint into the back of the airbrush, which is no bueno. And then the other issue with backflowing is that it might loosen up some like dried paint chunks in the needle passages, which will then get reclogged. So the only time I really backflow is when I've cleaned the airbrush out completely and I'm backflowing water in it to try to get any last bits out of there and then I flush it again. 
That brings me to my secret weapon, the mini glass beaker. Once I decided that thinning the paint in the airbrush paint cup wasn't a great idea, I started looking at other vessels to mix my paints in. I started off using one of those small metal dishes that you see people use, and it's very shallow. And while it mixed the paint fine or whatever, I felt like there was too much surface area that the paint would cling to and kind of just waste the paint when you mixed it. One of the reasons why I like the metal dish though is that it was solvent resistant, right? Because sometimes I use lacquer based paints and I wanted a vessel that can withstand using very aggressive thinners in it. I was looking at different options like test tubes or this or that and I thought why not a beaker, right? What's the smallest beaker that I can find online? And this is it. It's five milliliters. It's made out of borosilicate glass. It has markings on it. It's tall so that you don't get a lot of surface area that the paint clings to and becomes a waste. First, and most importantly, is the fact that you can actually see the mix through the vessel, which is going to be vital for learning what mixes work with what variables and equipment. The second thing that's a huge bonus with this mini beaker is that I actually don't need to use any mixing implements to mix the thinner with the paint. I put in a few drops of paint into the beaker, put a few drops of thinner in it, and then shake it or swirl it around pretty violently. And the paint will actually emulsify with the thinner and become one without introducing contaminants. Also, because it's made out of glass, it's obviously going to be solvent resistant. I recently saw a video on YouTube where a guy was using a method similar to mine, but he was using small plastic cups instead of glass. And while that might work for most acrylics just fine, uh, if you step into lacquer based paints, it might melt the cup. Also, the plastic ones, even with Acrylic paints might get kind of scraped up or hold on to the paint and other issues. So the mini glass beaker kind of tackles all of that. But there's one more thing that really stood out to me while using these mini glass beakers. And that's the fact that the surface is very similar to like the polished needle and nozzle surfaces. So when you're swirling paint around and you see how it goes up onto the walls of the beaker and how long it takes to come down or how much it's clings to the walls is really going to give you a great indication on how that's going to interact with the needle. So if it clings to the walls and doesn't come back down too quickly, that you're likely going to get tip dry a lot faster than if it were a bit thinner. I could probably go on for, for a lot longer about these mini glass beakers and how great they are for airbrushing and mixing airbrush paints. Um, but I don't want to beat a dead horse here, guys. I mean, you guys have seen me show these in a lot of the videos. They're amazing. They're easy to clean. Even after lacquer-based paints, I just drop them in my thinner jar, let them soak in there for a while, scrub them out. They're good to go. They're reusable, and the markings are etched in, so solvents aren't going to strip those from the beaker or anything. let's get on to mixing y'all. My process isn't about writing things down, calculating like the perfect ratio or anything like that. Here's the thing that we want to focus on when we use my method. We thin the paint in the beaker. We observe the paint in the beaker. We can do that by how I said you can see how it clings to the walls. You can see how it clings to the bottom when you tilt it. You're going to observe all of that in the paint and then you're gonna observe how it sprays out of the gun. I basically start with a very simple mix, like 50-50, one-to-one mix to see how that behaves. And then I also make a very thin mix, like a four-to-one or a five-to-one, depending on how thick the paint comes out of the bottle and see how that behaves. Those two mixes will give me a range where I can tell, mm, I need it to be closer to the thinner side. So in, instead of four-to-one, maybe I'll go to a three-to-one. And then you go from taking bigger steps to smaller steps until you're narrowed in on a desired viscosity. Once you've narrowed into that viscosity that works perfectly for the task at hand, take note. I mean, you don't literally have to write down notes, but mentally remember how the paint interacted in the beaker and how it sprayed in the task that you're using it for. And I promise you that when you focus on those two things instead of like calculating this and perfecting that, it will just kind of come intuitively to you. It will become second nature. I hope all this information I've shared with you will put you on a path to becoming a thinning wizard. 
It really is one of the most important things you'll need to tackle when you want to get into very fine detailed airbrushing. And just so you know, I've been working on an airbrushing series called Airbrush Unchained, where I'm covering everything from priming to applying color to a miniature, where I'm mostly looking at products, testing them, seeing how durable they are, and developing a really sharp underpainting that is nearly indestructible. The next episode is the fourth episode, and that will be covering feathering out after doing a Zenithal and Slap Chop underpainting. The application of the paint in that episode is going to be very fine, and I'm going to be using a fine airbrush with very thin paints. So I felt like covering how I thin paints was going to be an important thing before stepping into that episode. But... After that episode is the fifth one and the final one, and that's gonna be applying colors to a miniature, not just spraying, like, oh, I'm gonna spray my ultramarines blue and then paint gold on it later. I'm talking about ultra fine detail, as small as we can get it. So that's where the series is heading, and we're just about to the end. So if you wanna take a very deep look at airbrushing miniatures from the very beginning to end, definitely come check that out. I'm going to drop a link down in the description for the mini glass beaker and some of the other equipment accessories I use while airbrushing. Using those links comes at no cost to you, but it supports me in creating future content such as this. Whether you know me as Enzo Greymane, the Wily Wizard, or Night Owl Forge, you can always count on me to show you a bit of alchemy. <laughs> Until next time, keep thinning, keep mixing, and stay inspired. <laughs>